You're listening to the Revenue Growth Architects podcast presented by CS2. I'm your host, Xander Broffel, Director of Mops at CS2. And joining me today is Joy Martinez, Senior Director of Marketing Operations. Today, we are going to be diving into all things nurture strategy, not just email, no, all programs as it pertains to nurture so that you can get in front of your buyers the way that you need to. Let's take a look. Joy, what's the one thing that organizations get wrong about nurture? The one thing that organizations get wrong about nurture is sending a bunch of emails without having an overall strategy or bigger picture plan with goals that are actually surrounding what they're doing. Amazing. That was Joy Martinez, Senior Director of Marketing Operations with CS2. I am your host, Xander Broffel, Director of Marketing Operations with CS2. And today, we are going to be talking about the wonderful wide world of nurture. Amazing. That was Joy Martinez, Senior Director of Marketing Operations with CS2. I'm Xander Broffel, your host with the Forward Thinking Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about nurture and how you can do it more strategically and more effectively. Joy, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Thanks, Xander. I'm so excited to be on here with you again. It's a pleasure to be on. Absolutely. I look forward to any time that you are uh, on the podcast, and I know that our audience is as well. Um, This is a topic that we talked about a couple of podcasts ago uh, from a more like tactical, just how do how do I build a really good controller? Um, And leaving that conversation, I was like, there's more to be discussed about nurture. Um, And I know that this is something that you're quite passionate about, and I've learned a lot from you in this topic uh, while working together, and that is how to really be strategic about your nurture, right? Yeah, for sure. There's so much that goes into building, quote unquote, a nurture (laughs) that it's good to kind of back up and think about the strategy, right? I think that's one thing that, again, a lot of organizations miss, and it's really the needs to be the starting point of, you know, thinking things through of what you're going to do, because there's so many different avenues to take when it comes to nurture. There's so many different types. um, And it's really part of the holistic customer journey. So um, yeah, let's dive in. Awesome. So what is nurture at its most basic sense? Yeah, I mean, at its most basic sense, it's, you know, an opportunity for a company to meet the buyer where they are in their journey of getting to know them. It's an opportunity to build trust with that person um, and build awareness and educate that person and really help to, you know, allow that person to make a decision on if it makes sense to, um, you know, purchase from you. um, If you're a customer to, you know, really build loyalty. So, I mean, at its basic level, it's a great way to just earn trust and gain their business eventually. Fantastic. I mean, with all of those kind of various use cases, I'm hearing like, often, oftentimes I think about nurture and let's be honest, I always think it's just for prospects, brand new Mm -hmm. into the database, let's send them five emails and then call it quits. (laughs) Is is that the right approach to be taking or, or do you have other recommendations? Yeah. So, I mean, I think when people think nurture, email usually comes to mind. And I think that's because a lot of people think, you know, the email channel is free, quote unquote, because they already have this marketing automation platform. And it's like, oh, this is accessible. We don't have to invest ad dollars. Let's just set up an email nurture, right? Um, But there's so many other channels that you can use when it comes to nurture. And um, there's, you know, retargeting. There's, um, you know, different ads that you can do. There's webinars that you can host that are part of the journey, right? There's so many different marketing channels in in sales channels included um, that you can capitalize on to really um, give the right content to the right person at the right time and meet them where they are in that buying journey. Um, So you really have to think about the, the whole journey as a whole. So like one tip I'll usually give people is to map out their full customer journey. And it's surprising how many companies have never done that before. Um, And maybe it's for lack of, you know, truly even digging into the data and knowing what that journey even looks like. So it's a good opportunity to to dig in and do that. 
Um, but that will kind of allow you to see maybe gaps along the journey that you're not filling. And maybe those are the nurtures that you start with and you think about the channels that are going to resonate with that particular place in the journey. Um, and, you know, if you can map out that full customer journey and think through things like, where is this person engaging? How are they getting to know us? Um, where do our buyers tend to hang out at particular places in the journey? Um, that can also just, I guess, help highlight, you know, what type of nurture to even start with, right? Because there's so many different kinds, which I know we'll get to <laughs> talking about here soon. Um, you know, which one should you really start with? What's going to give you the the biggest bang for your buck and really help, you know, drive pipeline or additional revenue for the company? And it can be a very large undertaking if you truly map it out, because you're going to have different entrance points and each mm -hmm. of those entrance points may have a different approach to nurture. Um, you know, somebody coming in from a very high level awareness may be way different than somebody coming in from an event where they immediately had a conversation with the salesperson on the floor. For sure. uh, so it's very important to kind of think about how are people coming in and, and not just that, but what's the message that they've already received and what's that next message that they should receive? Um, to your point, you want to meet them where they're at. Yeah. It can be very overwhelming. And so... If I were to let, let's pretend that I mapped out my journey and I really had nothing in place, you know, somebody comes to download a, a, a white paper and they get an autoresponder and that's about it. Where would you recommend like I start? Yeah, um, I mean, start where you think you have the biggest hole to fill. Like if your goal as a company is very focused on driving new logo business start there with, you know, how can I educate and maybe drive more sales ready leads for the sales team to follow up on, right? Maybe it's not focused on that. And you're really focused on upsell and cross sell. I have a client that's more focused on cross sells and upsells. And they're actually their ABM strategy that they have and their target accounts are all customer accounts because of that focus. And so you know, that message to an existing customer who already has awareness of who you are, is already educated on your products, maybe not all of them, right, mm -hmm. um, is going to be a little different than somebody that doesn't even know who you are yet. So um, really kind of look at what your goals are as a company, where those gaps might be in the journey that you can fill. And also nurture doesn't have to be let me use this huge multi-channel approach where I'm like showing up everywhere. Sometimes it, there's almost like micro nurtures that you can do too, where it's like, Ooh, this could actually be like a two touch thing that will just really make a difference. And you may not know that until you start testing things, but mm -hmm. um, don't get overwhelmed thinking you have to take, you know, three months to build this huge grandiose strategy, you know, and just start with, what am I trying to do with my goals? Okay, how can I reach that audience right now? And take advantage of the channels that you do have available to you where you can, you know, take those target account segments and, you know, maybe you've got an email nurture, you can tell they're visiting your site, maybe they're not always converting. Um, and now you want to do some retargeting and you're driving in things there. Or maybe you're just looking at target accounts and looking at the engagement that they're doing. And then the sales is outbounding to them because I see their engagement alerts in Sixth Sense or Demand Base <laughs> or Terminus or whatever. And they can see some of that first party intent um, right on your website. And so, you know, look at where you can see some of those, even just micro opportunities that you have available to you with the tools and systems that you already have. Absolutely. I mean, as, as you think about mapping out the journey, you could say, I have gaps here from a content perspective. Oh, but if sure. you layer on top of that, like what your OKRs are for the quarter, maybe it's what are the biggest pain points that you faced in the last quarter that you wanted to make better this quarter? Mm -hmm. If you can start to layer that on and you can see like, well, in the buyer's journey, when I create the opportunity and I get that first meeting, I'm not getting follow up meetings. Well, maybe that's an area that you want to focus on and you can support that through some mm -hmm. data. And it's going to be a very different approach than if you were to take that like at an awareness level. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, talk to me a little bit about re-engagement, because I think that a lot of mm. nurture 
thought is around like brand new people. And yeah. there's a lot of folks in our organization's databases. Yeah. I mean, so when it comes to re-engagement, it could be at various points. It could be um, this prospect is maybe MQL'd a couple times. They've been through the life cycle. They've had a couple funnels. And for some reason, they're still being nurtured. You know, they're still in like kind of a recycled or nurture status with, with marketing. And they aren't progressing to an opportunity. And it's like, why, right? Like, what are the missing pieces? So maybe you're trying to kind of re-engage them in a different way. Um, it could be even re-engagement campaigns, um, more of like a, uh, I guess it could be like more of a pipeline acceleration, like with existing opportunities where your contact just goes cold and you're like, sales is like, we can't reach this person <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Marketing help us and provide some, some support to be able to re-engage them and get them fired up and excited about that open opportunity still, especially for companies that have like really long sales cycles, because it's easy to think like, oh, okay, those that maybe have like a 60 day or less sales cycle, you may not need a re-engagement, you know, in an opportunity type stage, but um you may if your sales cycle is six months, 12 months, like it, it takes a lot to keep that opportunity engaged, interested and keep progressing, you know, through and there's definitely points where marketing can support that and be aligned with sales. Um, and I do feel like there's also sort of a third that maybe could be classified under re-engagement, which is what I like to call the wake the dead campaign, or <laughs> sometimes people call it like a zombie campaign, right? Zombie nurture, where you just have a lot of leads in your database that are just not engaging with you. They're not visiting your website. They're not filling out forms. They're not opening and clicking your emails. Like, let's have a different approach, right? I think it, in marketing, it's... Uh, easy to want to just be like, oh, well, we have, you know, 100,000 leads where we're just going to, you know, keep blasting these emails out and not really paying attention to the results. And it's like, well, if you have this group of people in your database that aren't engaging with you in any way, your message is not even being read, let alone yeah. absorbed or educated or like anything, you know, you're putting all this work into creating content and the right messaging to reach those people. But if they aren't even opening it, they're not even seeing it. Your, your database is actually a small, small fraction of that. So, you know, re-engaging them in a way that is going to really come at them with perhaps a different channel than email nurture, right? And nurture them differently. Um, or perhaps like just a really different type of subject line and CTA in the email that you aren't typically using that might spur them to either re-engage or you're like, this person just literally hasn't done anything in two years. Let's make the decision to do some data hygiene and purge them from the database. And if they're truly interested and we're truly driving demand and, and awareness, they'll re-engage with us and, and re-enter the database at some point in the future when, when it makes more sense. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, at the end of the day, I keep on telling clients, there has been so much change in the workforce in the last four years. Mm. And if you have a database of folks that are older than, you know, two years, they may not be there anymore. No, lots of no longer theirs, right? Lots of no longer <laughs> theirs. So like Awaken the Dead is both good from uh, you mm -hmm. can find your hard bounces and immediately er eradicate those. You can also just find like maybe the persona just isn't the right target. Or maybe mm -hmm. they moved personas. I mean, you know, I started yeah. in support. I still get notifications on support tools. I haven't yeah. done that for 10 years, but like yeah. I, it, you know, you're still in databases somewhere. So. Yeah. And when you think too of like how those people even got to your database, right? Like some of them truly did engage with you at one point and knew who you were, right? They came to your website, they filled out a form, they got in your database. Some of them, depending on how strict your data hygiene policies are, may have just attended a trade show that you were at, and maybe they didn't even visit your booth. Maybe just they just attended the trade show, right? Yeah. So then you're putting kind of a lead in your database that doesn't have a clue who you are, and it's no surprise why they're not engaging, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we we think we're smart about who we know is interested in us, but to be honest, you know the writings on the wall when you look at the data and you know if you have a bunch of people that you just pulled in from zoom info or that you're just importing list after list and stuff and they truly didn't engage with you or even visit your booth or anything to begin with 
then that's going to be a lot colder of a lead to nurture and your approach might be totally different and <clears throat> purge <laughs> if needed. Right. You know, it's like, it just doesn't make sense to treat everybody the same. I think, you know, to your point kind of earlier, like if you have a nurture or somebody goes to your website and they download a white paper, you send them an autoresponder to your point earlier, you know, what other content is that you could you send them that is around that same topic, right? Like make it relevant and timely. Have that conversation immediately, quote unquote, immediately after they engage, right? You know, keep that conversation going because the second that you don't have that conversation continuing um, or the content that you start sending them is some generic nurture on something else, not at all related to what they've engaged with, which I call more of a behavior nurture, like let's send them more of that type of stuff based on their behavior that they did. Um, you know, then, then you're just going to lose them because it's not going to be relevant and they're not going to engage. And now you've lost a really prime window of an opportunity to engage with them and, and move them forward. So Joy, you've talked about there, there's multiple nurtures, there's multiple channels. Um, can you help our audience just think through some common types or strategies that they may be able to implement um, within their own tech stack? Yeah. And I think it's good to look at what your tech stack is and what type of data you have on the people that are in your database too, because like, Maybe you have already went through an ICP exercise and have really great personas built out, or maybe you don't, right? So like if you do, you could do um, an ICP nurture that's very focused around like what that particular persona cares about, um, maybe more job role based. Um, a lot of companies start with industry or vertical nurtures. You've probably seen that. <laughs> it's a great starting place because it's pretty easy data to get in your system. You can even enrich it, right? With Zoom right. Info or Ringleader, something to be able to draw in what the industry is. That's a very common data point to have, right? So, um, but thinking through like how your company sells and what they sell. So if you uh, are more of a self-service model, uh, with a really short buying cycle, or it's a really long white glove format, you may choose different formats of nurturing. Um, a lot of people, very common method is top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, and really aligning to the different points within that buying process um, and where they are. You know, top of funnel being very awareness driven, um, educating the person, providing timely relevant content based on what they've been engaging with. M middle of funnel or MOFU is the consideration stage. So, you know, being able to provide, um, you know, more deeper product information and a little bit more less thought leadership. And now you're more into like who we are as a company and what we do and what our products do and the benefits that it brings you and things like that. Um, bottom of funnel decision stage, right? So this is a lot of, people that are like, okay, we know who you are now. We get what your products are. Now I'm trying to, you know, decide between you and probably a set of competitors. And yeah. so, you know, you might use things like, um, you know, case studies and um, testimonials and very product specific webinars and um, buying kits like RFP, you know, or different things like that, that people can actually use during that decisioning process. A lot of people use third-party validation stuff at that point too, like, you know, a Forrester Wave report or a Gartner Magic Quadrant or any kind of third-party validating that you are who you say you are, your customers say, you know, have given good feedback and like they can really get kind of that third-party point of view and less about you telling them about you and more about that third-party kind of validating who you are. Um, and so building kind of that, that funnel, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel is very common. Within that, you can actually kind of drill down even to those persona or ICP levels, because if you're using tools like dynamic content in like a Marketo engagement program, for example, you can layer in, um, you know, dynamic content to really specify, okay, 
I want to maybe tailor this to industry or I want to tailor this to persona. And you've got that segmentation built out. You can, you know, you can do top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, and then layer in that second, you know, that second thing as well. Um, Solution-based um, nurtures. I um, had a client once that actually had like a content scoring program separate from their lead scoring program. And so they would, um, you know, know what type of content they were engaging with because certain contents lend themselves more to one product versus another product. And so they would go into more of a nurture tailored towards that type of content and product. Um, that's more of a, like a solution-based nurture, right? Yeah. Um, and then behavior based, I know we already talked about, but one thing that is really helpful is like people that are visiting your demo page that aren't filling out a form. Um, maybe they attended a specific event and had like a really engaging conversation with sales at, at a trade show or something. Um, you, you can have a really specific behavior based nurture based on that. Um, those are just kind of some of them. The one that I really want to highlight and not forget is customer nurtures, right? We have advocacy and, um, loyalty nurtures, um, ones that we're trying to build adoption, like through an onboarding nurture or something like that, um, is really key because it's not just about prospects, right? It's about our customers too, and upselling and cross-selling and, you know, really expanding or retaining that client. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of nurtures that you can do. And I think it just depends on what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, starting with, with what you think is going to best align to, um, to reach your goal. Yeah. And I think that it's really critical to, to think about like, what is my campaign structure? If you have very specific campaign messaging that you're going to do, that's another area. Um, I'm working with a client right now who is who is thinking of like different verticals, but then within those verticals, I have specific messaging that I want to get out. Those ones become a little bit more complex because it, it, it definitely requires more insight than you're going to get necessarily from a data provider. Um, and maybe it's going to be more inputs from the sales team. So maybe they have ways of like actually inserting somebody into that nurture. But the more, the more focus that you can get on your message that is solving a problem for that specific buyer, the better. Um, so I love those recommendations. And I like that you can layer on multiple things. You know, it's not just a, a stage-based nurture, but it is also a, a person-based nurture and a behavior-based nurture at the same time. So we talked a lot about like high level strategies. What are some of the things that you should consider when you are building out a nurture? Yeah, good question. There's lots to think about. <laughs> I think the very first thing to think about is obviously your goal, right? Because that could even determine how you want to uh, operationally set up your nurture in your marketing automation platform. Um, and how you would want to also track other channels within your nurture experience as well. Um, so thinking through not just your goal, but the metrics of how you're going to track that goal and how you actually want to report on it is important. Um, you know, like for example, in Marketo, um, you may need one nurture with 12 streams or you may need 12 different nurtures, right? Like it really depends on how you're drilling down your audience, how you want to be able to report on the success of it. Um, and, you know, see that, um, you know, in attribution and stuff. So understanding your goals and the metrics and how you want to report it is number one. I think number two is thinking through the entries and exits. So the entries, um, is any of your existing database that you would want to batch in and, you know, start going through it. And then also how people will trigger in, um, ongoing, right? Somebody fills out a form today. They enter your database today, they start the nurture tomorrow, like that sort of thing. So thinking through who is my audience for this um, that aligns with that goal um, and how am I going to trigger them into receive this experience or how are they going to start the experience? And then is there anybody in my existing database that I want to put through that experience as well, where I can segment and kind of add them in? That existing database yeah. thing? Um, I find to be very tricky, especially like if you're if you're trying to get something started mm -hmm. and, and you've had people in the database for a long time. So I just generally recommend like just think about that messaging. Maybe there's like 
if we're just talking email mm-hmm. nurture, right? Maybe the first email there is one that you that you have for your always going, and it's like an intro, and then maybe that first email is like a reintro or just less of a welcome to the stream, <laughs> yeah, and more of a I'm now starting. A yeah, nurture. that's true. So just something to something to really call. Yeah, out very there. true. I mean, um, kind of to our point earlier, you know, on reengagement, like have they even been engaging with us recently, right? Like if you just kind of mask, go, oh, everybody in healthcare, we're going to put into our healthcare nurture. Like that may not be it. Also, you may want to exclude people that are like already part of an open opportunity. And do you want to continue to nurture leads that are part of an account that has an open opportunity, right? Because your marketing automation platform uh, is probably just based on leads and contacts and not accounts. And so- Mm -hmm. How do you want to handle those leads and contacts that are in there that might be part of an account that has an opportunity, even though they themselves don't, you know, aren't a contact role in that opportunity, right? So there's a lot to think about in terms of your existing database and how you want to trigger people through. Um, You also want to think about bad exits or exits, I should say. There's good and bad exits. I went, I went a step forward. (laughs) I love thinking through exits. Uh, I don't know why. I just think they're fun. You know, different points of the nurture journey. Uh, When we're talking about email specifically, you know, a good exit is like, what is the success? Like, what are you trying to accomplish in this particular nurture? Uh, Maybe it's that you're trying to get them to a sales ready or to an MQL, right? So once they MQL or become sales ready for, you know, for follow up by sales, we're calling that success. Great. You need to be able to successfully know how to indicate when that thing happened. And then you also need to know, is there any points of exit that is going to kind of take somebody out of here in like, not a positive way, not a success. So maybe sales is working a bunch of leads, or maybe they have them in like outreach sequence or something like that. Uh, Maybe they're calling them and they've disqualified them now, but that person was part of your marketing nurture. So if they've already disqualified them, meaning they're not going to be ever be um, a customer, do we want to keep marketing them? Probably not. We probably need to exit them. Right. But you need to make those decisions around the entry and exit points to know when somebody can start, when somebody finishes and when they would be pulled out at any reason. And then if you have, um, you know, it depends on what marketing automation platform you have, but if you have Marketo, there's other features to like the engagement program that are helpful to think about. Like you could actually, even without fully exiting somebody, you could pause somebody in the nurture so that maybe they did some sort of behavior that would warrant them just pausing. And then maybe whatever would indicate that they unpause, they could just pick back right up where they were in the nurture and just keep going at the next uh, cast, right? So there are certain market animation platforms that have like really unique features to them, like like the pause and unpause or changing of the cadence from normal to pause to like in Marketo's engagement program that you can think about in terms of exits as well. Um, Marketo specifically, um, I like to think about even just like the way that you're going to build it because there's different features in terms of you could add emails to the streams, you could add nested programs, there's pros and cons. Um, if you want to be able to kind of exclude people that may be already engaged with that white paper um, that you're sending in your nurture already, you would probably want to use a nested program because you can listen for that engagement of that white paper in a nested program, a default program type, and you can exclude those people from receiving that um, so that they can skip that content in the cast. Um you know, I know Pardot and HubSpot kind of have all their own unique nuances. Um, so I'm just kind of providing some examples here. But, you know, thinking through the mechanics and the features of the different nurture program types is helpful. Um, content and messaging. You mentioned this a little bit earlier, and I'll touch on, I like to always have like a content library. And if you haven't created one, you should probably do a content audit and just see what content do we even have How does it map to the particular buying stages that we have? Is this more awareness, top of funnel stuff, right? Maybe you're like super heavy on top of funnel. You've got like a million blogs and eBooks and white papers and um, tip sheets and how-to videos and stuff that are just very top of funnel, but you're missing key pieces of middle and bottom of funnel, but you know you need to nurture around it. It's like, oh gosh, like in terms of, what the content team is going to do to build content is 
you know, supported by what goals you're trying to accomplish and letting the goals kind of drive what nurture we need and what content and messaging we need within that. And sometimes it's even working with like the product marketing teams to really nail down that messaging too. Um, and uh, help determine, you know, what type of content we want. I worked somewhere where we um, had a competitor who was also a partner of ours, which was a very unique scenario. Um, And so we were trying to win over some of the business, but do it through the partnership side of things um, because it was a very big brand name. I won't say the name. (laughs) Um, And we weren't going to just like, you know, like companies have that brand in house for a lot of things. And we weren't just going to win just on that. So we really created like a, it wasn't like a competitor takedown campaign. It was more of like, but targeting people that would have that specific competitive product suite of products, but use ours to add in this. Right. And it was very specific messaging. So we used that strategy to inform what type of content we needed to create to support our nurture. Very, very focused, a very specific use case. Um, So having that content library in place so that you know when you're building your nurtures, no matter what strategy you have, that you've got appropriate content um, uh, at your fingertips, whether it be prospect or customer content, right? And, and something that I've done with those kind of content journeys is also mapping it to personas. Mm-hmm. Like, like that way you really know, oh, I have a lot of stuff for my executive sponsor, but I don't have a lot for the practitioner yep. or I don't have anything for the challenger. Mm-hmm. Like those are areas that, that can be very, very useful. Yeah. So. Once you have that library in place, you can do what I call a content map. You can map it to ICP or persona, to vertical, fine stage, whatever slice and dice you want to do, right? <laughs> uh, once you figure out how you want to slice and dice it into different, you know, persona, vertical, whatever, and you have your content map in place, you can now pinpoint to where you might be able to see where you can repurpose content, right? Like it's not always about creating new content, brand new content, brand new content, like all the time. That's a lot of content production. And unless you have a big product or big content team that's supporting all all of that content production, which a lot of companies don't, um, you need to be able to use what you have. And sometimes that means taking an ebook and dividing that down into a blog post and a tip sheet. And, you know, and you're taking that big rock content and drilling it down into smaller pebble content. Um, That can be helpful Um, as well as like, because each each person's going to respond to content differently depending on the channel, right? Some content is more appropriate for social media versus email versus your website, right? And so you may need to really drill down and create some of that public content so that you have um, channel specific content that's really going to resonate with that person where they are. Um, One thing that I like to do once you've found kind of some of your evergreen pieces that perform really well, you've got your big rock content, you started building some pebble content, is also looking at um, what you can take from pebble content and build up into a bigger piece in calling it a toolkit or something like that. Like we had created before like a RFP toolkit, I remember, at the very bottom of funnel, right? It's in the decision phase of a nurture where you would, somebody would be filling out an RFP um, for your product. Um, And not all companies, you know, work off RFPs, but a lot do. And so we actually had an RFP template that people could download and use. We also put in some of those third party validating pieces of content, right? So we created this buyer's kit, this, this RFP toolkit that people could take advantage of. And the RFP template just happened to be one of the things in the toolkit. And these were all small, separate pieces of stuff we already have that we'd put together. And it's like, oh, here's your buyer's toolkit. Like, you know, and it didn't take anything but to just say, let's combine these together. And now we're going to call it a toolkit, right? So, um, and also when we knew that people were engaging with that, I mean, now we know that they're for sure in that decision phase. They're downloading that for a very specific reason, right? Not everybody's going to engage with that type of content. The next thing that I want to touch on is cadence or frequency. So, you know, I think people most of the time navigate towards, I'm going to send this one email a week 
one email every two weeks and they just keep this ever going, you know, cadence up. But sometimes depending on the nurture, it may be like an everyday thing. Um, like let's say you have a product or an app or something and somebody, you know, <clears throat> just joined and you need to onboard them. Maybe that customer nurture to really get them adopted and using your tool is to send something every day as like little onboarding steps that they can follow to, you know, build adoption and stuff. So, you know, think a Again, go back to your goal. Think about what you're trying to accomplish because the cadence and frequency really should be driven by, um, you know, things like how long is your sales cycle? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, things like that. And I think I think putting putting yourself into your your prospect or your customer's shoes of how many emails do I want to receive? 100. The example that you just gave made perfect sense for it to be sent out every day. It's not going to be the case for every email. And, and in right. those cases, just think about like, what is the message? How often am I, am I expecting them to respond to it? Maybe you have different cadences for people who are engaging with the content versus not engaging with the content. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, thinking again of platform specific here, but I'll mention it here quick. You know, Marketo has communication limits set up uh, in admin, right? Where you can specify how many emails somebody can get per week or per day. Um, definitely consider that if you have a strategy that is going to be sending emails every day or something like that, because you definitely don't want people missing emails because you have your admin settings set up to, re, you know, send a lot or receive a lot less content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, the, those communication limits are set globally, but you can override limits campaign by campaign. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of different cadences depending on what you're doing. So there's never really a good one size fits all, I think. For um, sure. How long should nurturers go for? Good question, because I have a pretty strong opinion on this. <laughs> 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 um, I think. <clears throat> OK, so let's say. I, I mean, it really depends on what type of nurture you're doing. Again, totally different, depends on what type you're doing. But if if you think it's been a decent amount of time based on the goal of the nurture, the length of your buying cycle, like all of that kind of stuff considered, don't just keep adding emails till you're blue in the face because, oh, we have people exhausting the nurture. We better add more content because an an evergreen, ongoing, forever in time nurture where somebody literally would receive emails for years upon years is not the solution. Because at that point, you have people that um, are probably like the wake the dead, right? That are not engaging. If they've gone through and you think it's a decent amount of time and they haven't engaged, you need to do something different with them. And it's not just feed them more of the same type of thing, right? You got to do something different. Sure. And so... <clears throat> I have a strong opinion of not literally I worked somewhere before where they wanted to nurture and just keep adding content. And like, we're requesting me to keep adding content to the nurture. And it's like, this person could literally go through here for a year and never repeat content. <laughs> never, you know, and it's like, if they're not engaging with you, is this doing anything? No, like, look at the goal, see if you're meeting it. If not, you may have to pivot and engage with them in a different channel or maybe just a whole different message. Um, or maybe you just made wrong assumptions or you've got bad data on the person, right? There's yeah. a lot of things that you can consider. Um, so I know that's sort of like, it's an answer, but not an answer to your question. But um, I think that depending on what all that looks like, you'll know if it's like too long or too short, yeah. right? Yeah. I think you can almost never go too short, but you can definitely go too long and then that's a mistake so makes perfect sense yeah this um, can get very complex right this can get very complex and and so I, i'm gonna try and wrap us up here um unless if there's anything really really critical that that we didn't talk through joy i think that we got through most yeah. of what we wanted to um, but I know that I know that we we did have a previous podcast that was talking about especially around controllers and traffic cops and, mm -hmm. and looking at data and looking at the reports. So it's it's another great podcast to go back to. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're architecting this effectively in whatever tool that you're using. 
Both of these podcasts have been very much centered around Marketo. We love the tools that they have access to. We do also love the tools that HubSpot and Pardot have access to for, for nurture programs, um, especially in the email channel. But again, think about the other channels that are involved in your marketing engine and, and making sure that you're sending the right message at the right time. Yeah, for sure. Sure. I mean, if there's it, any anything that you want to leave the audience with, please let me know. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just say, you know, if you haven't spent time doing it, spend some time to map out that customer journey, because then you know how you're able to nurture, right? You know the points of interaction that they do, um, and you can really figure out like what type of nurture strategy do we want to have, and what channels do we want to, you know, utilize. Um, and then just start somewhere, right? It's, uh, there's so many options and types of nurtures that you can do. So start with what you think is like the top couple use cases that might really make an impact on pipeline and revenue. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to do, right? Drive pipeline, impact revenue. <laughs> so, you know, stick to those things. Don't forget about your customers, right? They're part of the buying journey as well. Um, and, and just get started because, you know, you don't know until you start doing something and then you have some data and analysis to go back and tweak and optimize as you go. So, yeah, just get started. Yeah, you're not going to be done with this as soon as it's launched. It's a great opportunity to continue yep. to improve, right? Very iterative. You got it. Awesome. Joy, thank you so much for sharing your expertise in this area. It's very clear that you have a passion for nurture, and I know that you've done a lot to not only help your clients, but you've helped some of my clients with nurture, and I've learned a lot along the way. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in to the Revenue Growth Architects podcast presented by CS2. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. We greatly appreciate your support. We'll see you on the next episode.